Red Sister follows the story of Nona, a very young peasant girl trying to survive the crapsack fantasy world of Abeth. Abeth? Abeth? I'm going to stick with Abeth. It's a good book, and I'm very much looking forward to reading the rest of the trilogy, but this novel makes a mistake I can't get out of my head. I really want to talk about it, so <laughs> here's, here's all the context necessary in case you haven't read the book. And by the way, it's a solid recommend if you enjoy fantasy. The character work, the setting, and the lore are very strong to the point they easily make up for a plot that's on the weaker side, mostly because the protagonist is a, a young survivor and a good half of the plot boils down to stuff happens and Nona deals with it. The run up to the ending almost lost me. I'd say it's the worst part of the novel, but it finished strong enough to recover. The prose is good, and but at times inconsistent. There are some real beautiful gems and some real stinkers, but overall, it just gets out of the way and allows you to enjoy the story. Dialogue is pretty great in general, there's some fine bantering here, although sometimes it stretches believability when you imagine 12 year olds saying some of the lines. I'd give the book a very, very solid 7.5 out of 10. So, anyway, here's the context Abeth is a planet under a dying red star, where the ice caps have encroached so far that the habitable zone is reduced to a few hundred miles around the equator. At first I thought this was simply Earth in the extreme far-flung future, but I brushed up on the sun's life cycle and yeah, if, if our sun goes red, cold is the last thing you're going to feel as the oceans boil. You can imagine the technology level as something like medieval plus, you know, swords and bows and throwing stars and horses, all mixed up with these supernatural flavors, the source of which is undoubtedly all the technological marvels from previous civilizations that no one understands anymore. You know, the good old sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Oversimplifying, there's a precious few that can be born with one or more of the original tribal bloods that came from the stars. Hanska, with superhuman speed, Geraint, or Geraint, I'm going to go with the Frenchy pronunciation, Geraint, growing huge with superhuman strength, Margil, who are pretty much magicians, and Quantil, who can walk the path. The path is this enormous source of energy that can be tapped into for raw destructive power or for subtler manipulations of reality itself. The more steeped someone happens to be in their ancestry, the more powerful its manifestation. The extremely rare children who exhibit two or more of these ancestries are highly sought after, fought over, and killed for. So, at the early age of nine-ish, Nona is brought into a convent of battle nuns to be trained as one of their own after she displays enormous potential as a Hanska fighter. The events of Red Sister follow her first two, three years at the convent as she develops relationships, hones her talents, and learns to navigate this highly regimented environment. Her most important relationships are her two closest friends, Clara and Arabella. Nona meets Clara upon arriving at the convent. She's Hanska with dark hair and pale skin just like Nona, and she's the one to show her the robes and make her feel welcome. Arabella, a noble-born Hanska and Quantal Two-Blood, starts out as a snooty, popular girl type of antagonist, but after a few story beats, she also becomes Nona's close friend. But not so for Clara. She never warms up to Arabella, who she explicitly resents for being highborn, and implicitly she resents for stealing Nona's attention. You see, Clara's father, a formerly successful merchant, is in prison due to highborn machinations. So she gets meaner and meaner as the novel goes along, and as Clara gets older, she becomes outright selfish, materialistic, and callous to everyone. But still, it's always obvious she cares for Nona, with a very clear implication that she's got a big crush on her, which Nona refuses to even acknowledge. Arabella develops into your classic good person hero archetype, which makes the two girls clash even more. Mark Lawrence encapsulates it in one excellent line when Nona reflects on her best friend's personality. If you weren't Clara's friend, you weren't anything at all to her. Clara winds up selling out everybody to the main antagonist of the story in exchange for her father's freedom and a whole lot of cash. It's not a gleeful betrayal, she's somber and heavy-hearted and she was assured Nona wouldn't be harmed, which of course was a lie. 
It's a betrayal of her friends to save her family. And if you look at her character arc, it made sense for her to end up doing what she did. I, I really thought she was the best character in the whole book. The transition of Clara from best friend to someone not to be trusted is a steady build-up throughout the story and it would have been masterful if the novel didn't make the terrible mistake of too much foreshadowing. And I really wanted to talk about it because I can tell you the two exact instances in which it was too much and why it wasn't done right. The first just makes you raise an eyebrow. The second is an outright spoiler, as far as I was concerned. Okay, the first happens pretty early. Nona is an illiterate peasant, so she needs to be tutored by Sister Kettle in reading and writing. One week into Nona's stay at the convent, Sister Kettle warns her thus. The hardest lesson I ever learned was that every bad thing you see a friend do to someone else, they will someday do to you. Some people in this world are users and some givers. When two such form a bond, it often ends poorly. Find more friends, Nona. Clara Gomal spends enough time thinking about herself without you to help her do it. This is a figure of authority, likable and trustworthy, both to Nona and to the reader. She's been nothing but kind, and we have no reason to doubt her judgment. Even though by this point, Clara's been little more than a helpful friend to Nona, if a bit sassy at times, nothing out of the ordinary for a ten-year-old girl. So this warning, what, what it did, it immediately made me think, okay, I guess the author is setting up a fallout between them later on. Because that's the problem. This wasn't something that Clara did. It felt like Mark Lawrence himself was looking over my shoulder telling me, hey, 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 watch out. That 10-year-old, she's the bad one. Like, he just didn't trust me to realize this on my own. An editor's note here maybe would read, can you make this a bit more subtle? Maybe take out that ominous warning and just suggest she should make more friends and not just put all her eggs in one basket, especially Clara's basket. That way the reader may or may not pick up on the subtext instead of being bludgeoned with it. The second mistake and subject of this whole essay requires a bit more context. The novel includes three flash-forwards to a big dramatic showdown when Nona and the rest are already adult ordained sisters. The first flash-forward, at the very start of the book, describes one Sister Thorne getting ready to defend the convent all by herself against an army 200 strong. The second flash-forward describes the fight, but right before, literally on the previous page, it is revealed Sister Thorne is in fact Arabella, because nuns-to-be choose their names. Arabella will be Sister Thorne, and Nona will be Sister Cage. This is about half into the book, uh, the two girls have been rivals up to this point, and as far as Nona knows, Arabella tried to murder her in her sleep, so she's got some reservations. The flash forward unfolds, and Sister Thorn cuts down a good half of the enemy. She's spent, but still fighting, and that's when someone else enters the fray against her. Someone she knows. The spear takes her between the shoulders. She should have heard it being thrown, since its approach, known it was coming. But it came too swiftly, Hanska fast. Black skin turns iron hard, molded about the spear point, driving half an inch into her flesh but arresting the missile, denying it her life. She turns as she falls, sprawling amid the gore. Someone is leaving the Pilarthi ranks. A woman. S sister Thorne's vision is blurred with blood, with sweat, with exhaustion. The woman is not Pilarthi, but she holds a second spear. Thorne blinks and in that moment recognizes one who was once her sister. It is important, when killing a nun, to ensure that you bring an army of sufficient skill. The dark-haired woman hoists her spear. Everything so far is nudging the reader to think this dark-haired woman is Nona, the description fits, she's Hanska fast. Their grudge may have grown out of control and we are about to see it develop in the second half of the book. As I'm reading it, it's a bit of a bummer to think Nona won't fit in with the convent after all, but it's also interesting to have the prospect of seeing her turn her life around so radically. But then, the flash forward ends like this. Don't! Thorn raises her hand, not asking for mercy, but in protest. This is wrong. Don't do it! 
the spear is thrown. Who says that? Don't do it. The, the spear goes straight through her mouth? Who the hell utters this sentence? I'll tell you who. It's Mark Lawrence overplaying his hand. Using only the first letter, pretending like Thorne was about to say cage, but somehow could only go as far as k. It instantly makes you go, huh? Oh, okay, I guess it's not Nona, because otherwise he would have typed cage instead of trying to be so obviously ambiguous. And then, because you remember the nun's warning, you realize, oh, right, it's Clara. And here's the tragedy, what I really want to hammer home. After this twist became obvious, it transformed every bit of well-done setup and foreshadowing that came after. It truly is fantastic from a craft perspective, the way Clara gradually becomes less likable, but because of this single letter, I then saw every instance of her bad behavior as transparent preparation for the betrayal. It made me go, I see what you're doing here, man. It took me out of the story as a reader and into the writer's head. You just needed to stop typing, Mr. Lawrence. Just type, don't do it, and leave it at that. I'm simple-minded. You would have totally kept me guessing. I know this video is weirdly obsessive, but I just found it fascinating how this single letter made such a difference in my reading experience. I'm, I'm full of sympathy for the struggle to set things up properly without making them too obvious. It's something you worry about constantly when putting a novel together. I'm always looking for ways to improve my own writing, so the takeaway would be, if in doubt about foreshadowing, I think I always want to err on the side of subtlety. Because if I'm going to have one of the two problems, too much or too little, I much prefer for the clues to be hard to find instead of jumping out too much. And to always read your dialogue out loud, so your characters don't say things like, Kh! 